hello everyone. Uh, my name is Larissa Brasusa. I am a recent PhD graduate on citizen science and public health. Uh, yeah, I'd like to welcome everyone to the Australian Citizen Science Association Australian BioBlitz Symposium. Uh, the symposium is part of the National Science Week uh, engagement, and it is an, an initiative from the AXA National BioBlitz Bio Group. And this group has been growing uh, recently, and now we have like over 200 people participating. So it's got the time that we get together mm -hmm. and share our great stories, the stories of our bio blitzes, uh, some challenges, some opportunities that we can see in our groups, in our activities, and how we engage people in our local areas. And so we will use this opportunity, this symposium, to discuss a little bit what's the current bioblitzing uh, in Australia and or over the world, actually, and how we can increase the value of bioblitz to the community and to the science using iNaturalist. So iNaturalist is an open source and global platform. And yeah, so we will be hearing from different people sharing about like their local programs and yeah, how we can learn from the stories they share. Um, before we get started, I wanted to ask everyone if you could please uh, share where you were from. And if you are only naturalist, if you could please change your name on Zoom for your naturalist name. And yeah, I will pass on to Michelle. Thank you very much, Larissa. Before we begin, we'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today, all the lands on which we meet today, and we'd like to pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. A few little housekeeping things before we really get started. If everyone could uh, please, if you have an iNaturalist account, change your name if you can, here on, on Zoom to your iNaturalist username, just as something a little bit fun. And if you could also put in the chat where you're from and how you use citizen science, how you use bioblitzes. Have you been involved in any bioblitzes? Are you a coordinator or are you someone who just likes to have fun with them? We are recording this session. So if you would not like to have your image recorded, please turn off your cameras now. Keep your microphone and video off. There will be Q&A sessions as we go through this tonight. And, and any questions you have as you go, please put them in the chat. Thank you very much. And Libby, over to you. You're on mute. Thanks very much. Um, I'm delighted to be here and to be talking to you about bio blitzes. Um, you, you probably know that, uh, well, we've been involved in bio blitzes for a long time. So I'm, uh, I'm very happy just to share a little bit of my knowledge because we're, tonight's um, session is all about um, looking very briefly at where, where, how we've got to where we are but taking a bit of time to see how bioblitzes have changed and to really try and think about what we might be able to do to, um, to advance them for, for better science and for more for the community uh, because of some of the, the, the lessons that we've learned already. So I'm just going to share, share the screen and, and I've got a very short uh, presentation for you. I hope. There we go. Right, so um, very briefly, um, my own experience with BioBlitz has started in, in uh, Devon. I was very, I heard about them and I was very interested. So I happened to be in Europe and I went to the um, BioBlitz uh, run 
at Mount Edgecombe, which is just out opposite Plymouth down in Devon. And it was a, a wonderful experience. The ponds look a bit different in, in the UK than they do here. And we had a, a bus from France, uh, some citizen scientists in France coming to work with us. And it was just a, um, a life-changing experience to be part of this thing. And so I came back to uh, Australia and um, thought, because we'd started the Atlas of Life, then we should do something here. And our very first one was the next year. So this is 2012. And I used the same kind of model that they have in the UK, um, which took about three months to organize. And we I think we had about 70 surveys over two days. Um, and it was a mixture of schools and, and uh, lots of naturalists and uh, local naturalists and also uh, visiting scientists and experts uh, that came with us. And what I would say is that over the years that we've done bioblitzes and we've done, I think we've done eight in our local region um, and we've done others in other places like um, the first one at um, the Great Barrier Reef at Early Beach and also helped with the, the one, the Sydney Olympic Park bioblitz. Um, and the Black Mountain Bioblitz. So we set up what, what was, a, I suppose, is a very traditional sort of Bioblitz where it's centered around a base camp and you have lots of people in, involved in, and in all sorts of ways. And we tended to do it over two days, something like that. Um, the base camp was really, really important. And the survey leaders were really, really important. And what we've discovered is that we've had um, an amazing group of, of, uh, uh, of survey leaders, people like Stuart Harris here, who um, has been with us almost from the beginning of when we started running BioBlitzes. And um, in a BioBlitz, the survey leaders are the rock stars. They're wonderful people, whether they're local naturalists with a passion or whether they come like uh, Glenn Cocking, who's a um, moth expert, comes down from the, um, the National Insect Collection in, in Canberra. Um, or Stephen Skinner, who comes from the Royal Botanic Gardens in, uh, in Melbourne. Um, and they come every time because uh, they really enjoy it and everybody really enjoys working with them. So this is where a BioBlitz where you have a survey leader, people sign up, they, the survey leaders say how many people they want to have on the survey and uh, it's all time bound and everybody goes off and does it. So that's the model that we've worked with um, basically all the time. Um, but after we started BioBlitz, as, we, as I say, we've helped a number of groups. Um, we helped the uh, Discovery Circle down in Adelaide, um, the Reef Blitz and uh, the sl uh, Slopes to Summit. Um, various people have done various things and I don't know all, all of the BioBlitzes that have gone on at all but lots and lots over the years um, have developed and, and uh, the scouts are doing them now. There's all kinds of things happening. So, and also the, the platforms that we use, how we record what we find has changed very much over time. So we realized that lots of people were interested in, in bioblitzes. So we got a working group together and we, we, we developed this, uh, um, this BioBlitz guide, which we did, and I was surprised to see when it was. It was actually 2015 when we set this up. And it, there were all sorts of tips and things and, and helpful ideas and talked about the shape of it, but it was very much that particular model. So we were only really talking about one particular model of BioBlitz. And as I said, things, are, things have very much changed since then. So this session, here today is to explore new ideas in bioblitzes. Um, and I'd like to hand over to Michelle, who's going to in introduce the next uh, presenter. Michelle? Absolutely. Thanks very much, Libby. Now, our next presenter is 
someone you may not have heard of yet, but she's making big waves in the school bioblitz scene. I'm, of course, talking about Judy Freelander. Judy, would you like to explain how you uh, foresee uh, bioblitzes, particularly for schools? Thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, should I start my slide show? I will do that now. Yes, please. Okay, here we go. Slide show. Right. Can everyone see that? Yes, thank you. So thank you very much for inviting me. And uh, what I will be talking about is the B and B BioBlitz. So just a little bit of contextual information. The B and B BioBlitz or the citizen science aspect um, of our program is something that has been growing. When I talk about our program, I'm talking about the B and B Highway, which is the flagship project of planting seeds projects. So the B and B Highway stands for bed and breakfasts for birds and bees and biodiversity and it's practical and it's educational and we go into schools the aim is to form corridors for regeneration focusing on pollinators and plants because we're losing pollinators so we go into schools and schools are hubs for these corridors the aim being to generate corridors for regeneration through schools. We started a few years ago, we will have 100 by year end and we are in two states in urban and regional and hoping to be in Queensland soon and hopefully other states as well. So as I said, it's a educational and practical initiative and we go into schools from preschool right up to year 12, in some cases university, it's mainly primary schools and we do four um, sessions and they're each indoor outdoor we talk about biodiversity we talk about plants pollinators we focus on a pollinator that's of interest most people think that pollinators are just bees it's an incredible education for people to realize that we have 2,000 native bees alone in Australia or 1,600 to 2,000 um, we might talk about bats, we might talk about birds, but it's basically a vehicle to explore biodiversity. And then we talk about plants and we plant. Citizen science has become an area that's growing in interest and we see it as a fantastic way to integrate technology and also um, it's a fun outdoor activity. So the B and B BioBlitz, excuse me, why is that not going? I'm terribly sorry. That doesn't show my technical ability at all. Um, so the B and B BioBlitz is actually running in September, which is National Biodiversity Month. And we're actually running the BioBlitz in schools around Australia. And we've been busy promoting it. We've had the support of the New South Wales Department of Education. Um, and also ACTS has been involved in helping us promote it as has the Atlas of Living Australia, um, CSIRO's Atlas of Living Australia. Um, various departments of education are also very interested in it. And uh, so we're running it, as I said, in September, which is National Biodiversity Month. And in the first week, because I think September the 7th is National Threatened Species Day. And we are finding that the teachers in the schools, this is based on our experience going to schools, most of them have never heard of citizen science. So there's actually an incredible disconnect between citizen science, academics and experts and aficionados and the educational professionals. Um, a lot of people haven't heard of bioblitzes. So it's a, it's a matter of holding hands and making it incredibly simple. The last few years, of course, have been very problematic for teachers. And so we find initially we would send instructions on how to join iNaturalist and explain how it connects to the Atlas of Living Australia, but they didn't have time. So we're essentially helping them get up onto iNaturalist and explaining to them that all they need to do with this bioblitz is to take students out into the school ground 
in a lunchtime or a recess to take some observations and for one teacher to upload the observations. We've been running a series of workshops. We've run three to date. Um, as of today, we've had 160 people around Australia signing up and I suspect there'll be a lot more by the first week of September. Thomas Misaglio, who is going to be presenting late, has been assisting us and showing and demonstrating to teachers how to upload images and how to find how basically to negotiate you know the basic elements so what we do is this is I'm not going to run through this because you know what a bioblitz is but this is the type of slide that we would show the teachers who are attending the session and what I think is really fascinating is that every time I read a journal article or most times that talks about biodiversity and the problems we're having and how we're losing pollinators and species hand over fist. They talk about how important citizen science is. The Office of the Chief Scientist talks about it. The State of the Environment report just released talks about it. Everybody talks about it, but who's doing it on a broader scale? I mean, I know a lot of us are, and it's really important, but I just find it's incredible the disconnect as well with these major educational institutions. Um, so this statistic 5% is from Dr. Erin Rogers' uh, research. And um, only 5% of citizen science projects in Australia are urban based. When you think about the fact that 95% of us are living in urban areas, and then as the State of the Environment report just stated, that 45% of animals, of no plants of national significance, live in urban areas, and 25% of animals, no, the other way around, plants, that is extraordinary. So I've run through that information. Um, Thomas comes in, as I said, and he provides tips um, on how to upload to navigate the basics and tips for top photos. We're offering some prizes. And then we just briefly explain just some very simple examples of student activities. And teachers are amazed a lot of the time to realize that there are pretty simple STEM activities and that citizen science lends itself to a whole array of key learning areas, not just maths and science, but geography, English, et cetera. So we run through that. We, we don't have that much time in our sessions because it's, it's probably enough just to convey the basics of what citizen science is. So I think that's all I had to say. I just, the only other thing I was going to mention is that my research actually, I'm not a tech person or a scientist as is probably pretty obvious from my lack of ability to negotiate a slideshow. My background's media and journalism and I've always been really interested in how to engage people with difficult environmental issues. I used to write as an environmental journalist um, for the Herald, Sydney Morning Herald, and I've worked in television and, and I've been very concerned about the disconnect. And so the research shows you have to make things positive, practical and scalable. And this is where citizen science comes into its own, especially through, through things like leaderboards, which is what BioBlitzers can offer. So we've got all the schools up on a leaderboard. It's going to be fabulous for them to share knowledge, data and information. So um, I'll leave it there because I think I only had five minutes. And thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Libby, I believe it's over to you. Yes, thank you. Um, I've got the delightful task of introducing Thomas Misaglio. Um, if anybody doesn't know Thomas, then um, he, he came into our world a few years ago and um, brought enlightenment to lots of us. Um, he works on uh, iNaturalist. He's a PhD student um, and he works on iNaturalist, but he knows the the front end of iNaturalist, but he also knows the back end of I, iNaturalist. He knows how it works. He knows all the things about it. So he's been wonderful in giving his time to everybody who needs it to help them to do better, to, to, to understand more in terms of what they're doing and how they're using it. So for this session, I've asked him uh, particularly to think about how, how we can increase the scientific vi value of bioblitzes. Bio so again, I'll, I'll, he's not here, I'm afraid he's in the Western desert, um, probably put, adding even more thousands of um, uh, records to his tally. 
but uh, he's done us a very nice little video uh, to guide us to, tonight. So here we are, let's see if I can do it. As with my talk from a few days ago, apologies for not being available to present in person, but I'm still in remote Western Australia. And as a matter of fact, I'm actually participating in a BioBlitz right now as you're watching this. Now, of course, one of the major and most important elements of BioBlitz is, is community engagement. They're a great way for members of the public to connect with experts and to inspire the next generation of naturalists. However, it's also crucial to consider the scientific value derived from BioBlitzes. These events are invaluable periods for collecting high volumes of biodiversity data. With this in mind, it's always worth exploring strategies to increase the value of these data. But before we can devise these strategies, we have to define what scientific value actually means in the context of a BioBlitz. There are plenty of metrics to choose from, but I generally like to focus on five key points. First, and perhaps most obviously, bioblitzes during which large quantities of data and observations are collected will almost always hold high inherent value. Even if many of these records are common species, the more data points that are collected, the higher the chance that something rare or extraordinary will also be recorded. I should also emphasize that common species are important to record too. All too often you get a situation where everyone assumes that someone else will record a common species, and so in the end no one does. And not to mention, if we don't record common species, they won't appear as common in data sets. A good rule of thumb is to therefore engage with any bioblitz with the intention of recording every single species you can possibly find. Second, there is a lot of value when records can be identified for species. Of course, there are many instances where genus records or even coarse attacks alike family can be valuable depending on the context, but typically observations are most valuable when the organism can be identified for species. Value is therefore derived explicitly from identifiable observations, which entails either specimen collection or high quality photographs of important diagnostic characters. The discovery of undescribed species is a no-brainer, especially if specimens are able to be collected. New records for the location and focus will always be valuable, whether it's recording an invasive plant in a state or territory for the first time, or a dragonfly in a national park it's never been seen in before. These records help extend our knowledge of species distributions and subsequently inform conservation and control efforts. Perhaps the most underrated aspect is recording previously unknown information about species. What I mean by this is things like observations of fruit or flowers in a plant that was only known from vegetative material, or being able to link the larval and adult stages of a rare insect for the first time. As one example, I photographed this herbertia during a recent bioblitz in Western Australia. These are seemingly the first and only known photographs of this species in the field. So how do we achieve as many of these five points as possible during any given bioblitz? There are two core strategies that I think are among the most important to employ. First, engage super users. These are highly efficient, highly productive participants that can single-handedly record thousands of observations during a bioblitz. They've usually participated in a number of events before, are great at finding rare and unusual species, and know exactly where and when to look for them, and what features they need to photograph for any given taxon. Any Australian iNaturalist user will likely have encountered the name Nick Lambert before. He's an outstanding naturalist from near Coffs Harbour, and is one of the most prolific iNaturalist users in the entire country. He's currently sitting in second place for both observations and species observed, and will likely move into first place by the end of the year. He's the best bio blitzer I've ever had the pleasure of working alongside. 
During last year's Great Southern Bio Blitz, he observed over 1,100 species in just four days. I've participated in a number of Bio Blitzes with him now, and when we wrap up each event and compare observations, there are so many species that he observed that I missed, even during times when we were standing within 10 meters of each other. I cannot overstate the importance of engaging with naturalists like Nick during bio blitzes. They are the powerhouses that collect huge amounts of high value data. Concurrently, and also very importantly, these super users should not be used as survey leaders during bio blitzes, but rather allowed to blitz of their own accord. It's okay if some super users are utilized as survey leaders, but only if other super users are available to also do their own thing. Whilst employing someone like Nick as a survey leader during a blitz would certainly enhance the community engagement side of the event, it would be greatly detrimental to its scientific value as it would slow him down and prevent him from maximizing the number of observations he could make. The second key component is engaging with local experts and knowledge holders. These are the participants that know exactly where to find every species in their local area and thus greatly expedite data collection. I traveled to Western Australia last month to do two weeks of bio blitzing, in addition to the event I'm participating in right now, with Nick and Pete Crowcroft, who you'd know from my naturalist as Possum Pete. On one of the days, the three of us traveled to High Valley Farm near Bajinjara. The property is run by Don and Joy Williams, two highly experienced naturalists who know the biodiversity on their property and the surrounds like the back of their hand. They spent the day driving us around in a four-wheel drive, showing us rare species like the sun orchid, Thelamitra apiculata, or Petrophily nivea, the vulnerable plant for which their property contains the only known populations in the world. If we had visited their property and made our own way around, we likely would have never observed these species in the time we had. Don and Joy's incredible knowledge and hospitality greatly increased our species count, both directly when they explicitly showed us the species and indirectly by saving our time searching for them, meaning we could spend that time searching for other taxa as well. Thus, for any given bio blitz, a critical step is finding out who the key local experts are before the event and ideally engaging them as survey leaders or participants. Of course, without the many other participants of BioBlitzes, we also lose out on important data and observations. And it takes the combined efforts of many enthusiastic naturalists and experts to make a BioBlitz successful. But engaging super users and local experts will take your BioBlitzes to the next level. All oh, right, there we are. That was um, quite a um, a full stop there. But uh, as usual, um, as usual, Thomas gives us a, a really interesting, really succinct um, advice, and he has helped enormously in terms of how we all use and and uh, work our way around iNaturalist. And if you've got a project like ours, which is an area project, our, our, our project, the Atlas of Life, we've just had our 10th year last year. Um, we're on the far south coast of New South Wales, and we've got a shape within iNaturalist. So if you want to see who are the, the, I won't say we've got any super users here, but we've got some really good people. All you have to do is to go into your area um, and actually look to see who are the ones who are putting up lots of uh, sightings and if they've got any specialisms. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Thomas, for that. And now I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker. Uh, we'd like to thank very much Associate Professor Will Cornwell from the University of, of New South Wales. Um, we've recently seen that there's been uh, a tremendous series of, of bio blitzes um, in New South Wales post bushfire. Um, and these are the, these bio blitzes I think are the, the biggest and also um, probably the best funded bio blitzes that we've had. So it's really interesting for us to see um, how, how they were run and how they were organized and what, what 
people were hoping to get out of them and whether they actually delivered on, on the goods. Will, is, uh, his research interests are uh, the intersection of plant ecophysiology and community ecology and ecosystem ecology. He's especially interested in using basic ecological tools, especially functional traits to understand the effects of climate change on terrestrial biodiversity. So um, with th that perspective and looking at an area post bushfire, then I'm sure he's got a lot to tell us. Thank you very much, Will. Thank you. Thank you, Libby. That was a very nice introduction. Uh, can you see my slides? All right. Yep. All Thank good. You. Thanks. Uh, great. Well, uh, well, thanks. Thanks, everybody, for coming and for listening to us talk about um, what Libby described. There are a recent uh, series of bio blitzes, some distributed and some in person, uh, which we we collectively call the Environment Recovery Project. And the, the the five key people involved are here. We have Richard Kingsford. We have Thomas, who we just heard heard from in the last talk. Uh, Casey um, Gibson slash Kirkhoff, who I'll, I'll talk a little bit about more later. Myself and Mark Ui, and we we kind of together are the core the core group that organized the the Environment Recovery Project. Um, Casey is actually the the leader in most most of the aspects of what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, Thomas, as as everyone just mentioned, everyone knows from as the beachcomber on iNaturalist. This is where he is currently bio blitzing. I wanted to show the the current remote location where where they're organizing the bio blitz at Yale Lakes National Reserve Nature Reserve, and he's keeping me updated via sat phone about what they're finding. But a whole whole another set of challenges in organizing a bio blitz in that kind of a that kind of a remote remote location. Uh, so the the outline for the talk. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the origins of our project, the distributed phase, then the big bushfire bio blitzes that Libby mentioned, uh, the results just far so far, and then some takeaway messages in using citizen science data for scientific research, uh, which is a lot of what I do in my research um, program. And then also a little bit about data collection design, which Thomas also touched on in his in his recent talk. Uh, so this is actually where Casey lives. This is uh, was her house here in the Southern Highlands. Uh, we had a lab writing retreat there uh, a few months before the bushfires. And it's this beautiful, beautiful place with the big gardens and nice sort of very, very scenic setting. And uh, as everybody's aware, in the, in the summer of 2019, 2020, after this very, very long drought, there was a, a long event of kind of fire weather uh, which moved from the north of New South, from southern Queensland and the north of New South Wales, further south, and burned an unprecedented amount of southeastern Australia, uh, and it was a very, very traumatic time for for a lot of people across across the whole region. Uh, and this is what actually happened. So the fires, at some point, came in th up from from Kangaroo Valley, and there was a sort of extreme weather event with. Uh, very strong southerlies and that blew uh kind of a very high severity fire into casey's sort of region and casey's house and this was kind of what was left after that after that event uh and this was a really really sort of um kind of traumatic time for a lot of people across the whole fire grounds and it's it's hard so much has happened since that point and it's hard to to remember kind of that the, the mental space that a lot of folks were in who were really affected by these fires. And this is this is a look at the forest close. This these were little videos taken by Casey of the forest just close to where where her house was before the fire and then and then after the fire. And you can see this really high severity, very hot fire, which consumed the entire canopy, scorched everything. And the, the immediate aftermath, it was really what felt like devastation and kind of ashes everywhere and nothing alive. And, and it was really kind of a very dark, dark period. Um, and this is a video which, which Casey also took shortly afterwards. I don't know if you can hear the sound, but you can see the very, very high severity fires. And then uh, you might be able to see just here, uh, a few glossy black cockatoos flying across the sky. 
which was this really sort of uh, very powerful event. You know, like th there is still life out there, and and you know everything wasn't consumed in the fire, and there there is this, this biodiversity, and there is going to be recovery. And that was a very strong kind of emotional feeling at the time. Uh, and so Casey, what Casey was doing you know, on her property was taking lots of pictures of what made it through, which was not very much, but then slowly the recovery of, of the plants, the fungi, the animals coming back from this devastating, devastating event. And it wasn't just Casey who was doing this. People were doing this all across the state, across the whole region of Southeast Australia, because this, there was this really feeling of devastation and darkness and ash and destruction. And then these little hints of life. And those really hints of life were very important psychologically and emotionally. And, and, the, and the recovery of nature was very, really a profound kind of thing to observe. And so everyone was taking these pictures, um, not because we told them to, but because they felt the importance of the situation. And our role really, uh, when we discussed what Casey kind of came to me with this idea of kind of organizing everyone's photos, was just to get people to take the photos that they were already taking in the part of the firegrounds where they were and to organize it in an iNaturalist project such that it can then go on to be scientific us and, and everyone else and everyone who's interested in fire ecology can then go on to do science and also to bring together a community of people who are having the same experience of devastation followed by very, very, very slow recovery. Uh, so that was the origins of the Environment Recovery Project. Um, and it eventually it was uh, through lots and lots of effort and kind of effort by many people. I think I saw a lot of familiar INAT names in the chat. Um, we're now up to 20,000 observations of 3,000 species. So it kind of came together across, across the whole firegrounds to contribute to this project. So the reasons to be distributed at the beginning, uh, one was safety. So we couldn't do kind of these in-person bio blitzes because a lot of national parks were closed, a lot of roads were closed, uh, and there was a lot of safety concerns at the time. But people were on their own properties or they were working in the firegrounds for other reasons, and they were taking these pictures anyway. So this project allowed that data to be organized. And then also the giant scale of the fire just couldn't kind of the focused focused bio blitzes were the, kind of the wrong tool for for the for the for the event at that time. Uh, so the photos that were coming in, some of them were really striking and beautiful. Uh, this was a beautiful one from the south coast of, of the insects which were washing up on the beach. Um, many, of, many of the things at the beginning were, de were dead animals, uh, some of them quite gruesome at the beginning. But then you started to see this recovery, uh, things coming back and the resprouting of the forest. And then these kind of beautiful insects starting to emerge. This is from Paula Bauer, who was uh, one of our, our biggest contributors to the project, who ended up writing a book actually about her experience observing nature in the post-fire post fire environment. Um, uh, this was the, the Mount Kapitar pink slug, which actually there was no public information that it had, it had survived the fire until we started to see it come into the project that you know its entire distribution was burned, but it seemed to make it through. And there were observations of citizen scientists on the ground to demonstrate that it actually had made it through, which was pretty amazing. Um, this is a uh, greater glider from the middle of Wallamai National Park, which is the biggest fire in the history of New South Wales. Somehow it found enough things to eat to make it through, which is pretty also pretty remarkable. And then this is one of my favorite organisms, the pink flannel flower, which was like these beautiful, beautiful little flowers, which popped up about a year after the fire in the Blue Mountains and the Southern Highlands. Now they've all bloomed, made their seeds, and they've gone back to the seed bank. And they're just sitting in the seed bank waiting for the next fire. You cannot find a pink flannel flower anywhere in Australia at the moment due to the lack of fires in the last couple of years. Uh, so that was the, the distributed part. We ended up with 20,000 observations and pretty amazing contribution from lots of people all across the fire grounds. The second phase was the big bushfire bio blitz that, that um, Libby introduced, and this was really building on the methods that she talked about at the beginning of the symposium. So all of those things, the, the base camp, the survey leaders, all of that stuff, we, we wanted to, we didn't want to reinvent the wheel, we just wanted to build on that and, and, and go from where, where all of the positive experiences in the past and use that, use that knowledge to, 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 to bring to bear on this, 
this project, which is to document burned and unburned before and after the fire, um, build on that data. And there are lots of partners on this, including the Atlas of Living Australia, um, Andrew Foundation, and others. Uh, so this is uh, basically what we did was these, these in-person bio blitzes using these methods that, that have been developed over the last several years. Um, this is the one which was the most nicest weather and the most beautiful one. We had a big challenge. Uh, so here are the three, the three big events. So we basically replicated the same thing using different on the ground local expertise, um, different uh, contributions by contacting the, the traditional custodians of the land in each place. Um, to get the traditional owners involved. Um, the first one was supposed to actually be in the in the north, the rainforest of the north coast, which ended up being canceled and then moved due to the floods which occurred. Uh, the second one was the, the, the Greater Blue Mountains World Heritage Area, big bushfire bio blitz. And that one actually did take place in the midst of a driving rainstorm. So I don't have any pictures of that because it was such a kind of intense experience of, of downpour and trying to look at to do a bio blitz in adverse conditions. And then the, the forests of the New South Wales South Coast, which took place in good, beautiful, beautiful conditions. I do have lots of photos of that one. Uh, this was the main challenge, of course, which we did not foresee that there was going to be another sort of extreme weather event, but this is kind of the reality of doing bio blitzes in the, in the age of climate change is that you do get extreme, extreme weather. So there's unprecedented amounts of rainfall falling right when we had a plan to do the bio blitzes, um, but um, persevered through it and, and still collected uh, lots of amazing data uh, and had lots of fun also while doing it. Uh, the summary statistics, uh, just quickly, uh, Thomas kind of touched on the method, the, the approaches, some of the things that we uh, try to incorporate kind of using super users, don't put the super users as, as survey leaders, um, and really tapping into local expertise whenever possible, which Casey was really great at networking with the local experts in these regions. So the summary statistics for the three on the ground bio blitzes, uh, almost 8,000 observations of 1,700 species with 600 people participating, either as observers or identifiers. And just to put that into context compared to my lifetime stats, like I'm a pretty avid iNaturalist user uh, and I've you know, taken observations all across the world, but I'm still only up to 1,200 observations with, of 800 species. So really by bringing the community together and, and, and getting the kind of collective energy going at these um, places, we're really able to generate a lot of data. So much, you know, seven times what I've been able to generate in my entire life. Uh, so yeah, so the contrast, so I'll talk a little bit about the science. So the contrast we were trying to make was before, after, and burned versus unburned, which is the sort of the basis of the, the whole project. There's important points that in incorporating this into science is the presence of an organism versus the detectability. So this is a midge orchid, which was taken by photo by Nick Lampert, who uh, Thomas just mentioned. This is a post-fire flowering species. So, so there are many, many species which, which disproportionately fire in the post flower in the post-fire environment. And that makes them much more detectable. Uh, so there's lots of ways that something like fire influences not the presence of the organism, but the ability of us to observe it. So it's very easy to identify the species when you get the flowers, but very, very difficult if it's not flowering and sometimes impossible for some species. So that's an important thing to think about in doing science on this type of data. The other thing is high severity versus low severity fires. So the, the fires near Casey were super high severity, so extremely, extremely hot. Um, but in other parts of the fire ground, they were not. Uh, they were much lower severity and sometimes didn't even get into the canopy. And so that has a big effect on the recovery and the organisms observed in the post-fire environment also. And then the last thing, which is a little technical, uh, but actually really important, I think, to mention, is accounting for variation in effort. So it's very hard to keep effort standardized in these kind of um, data collection efforts. Because of the weather in the different places, the number of observers who turned up for the different bio blitzes, and all sorts of other factors, it's very hard to standardize effort. Uh, but luckily, there's these new statistical techniques that were developed by uh, this really, really smart statistician called Ann Chow in Taiwan, 
uh, about how to to account for effort and it uses a kind of next generation thing called next generation of what we used to call rarefaction um, if there's any ecologists in the audience but so the, but that's really a big breakthrough for citizen science because uh, we didn't really know how to account for effort previously and now now we can uh, so quickly the results this is work from Simon Gorta who is the research assistant for me we looked at lots of different habitats, lots of different taxonomic groups, and then severity contrast before and after the fires using the data from all the parts of the project. And what we found was a hump-shaped relationship with fire severity. So this is diversity on the y-axis and fire severity on the x-axis. And we found this really interesting thing where moderate severity fires had higher diversity than there was before, which could be about detectability, um, can't definitely can't rule that out, but extreme extreme fires did not have this effect. So there was some kind of a depression in the diversity following the really really hot fires. Uh, and if to look for which groups actually were responding in this way, it turned out insects and monocots, so including orchids, but also grasses and sort of lily lilyales kind of things, were the ones which we really saw that increase in diversity index after the fire compared to the before. So I think it's really exciting new science that came out of came out of this effort. So last, um, designing bioblitzes for science, add value to existing data. Uh, Thomas mentioned this. In contrast like burned and unburned are really difficult, but very powerful when you find them in terms of designing bioblitzes. Uh, these contrasts can be restoration too. It doesn't necessarily have to be a negative event, it can be something, some sort of positive uh, thing that where, where people are trying to make effective positive change. Um, and Thomas kind of mentioned this, but there's there's a lot of value in looking for everything. And then uh, the next steps, um, I think documenting photographic quality, which I think people, a couple of people mentioned already, that will really promote the future use of the best photographs for science and future ID problems and targeting difficult and undersampled groups with help from experts. is also really important, but we need better ID materials to really make that work. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Will. That was fantastic. And um, I, I'd be interested just to ask you a question about um, the bio blitzes were one-offs in those particular places. Um, but do you see the, the, the possibility because you bring the community together for a bio blitz that you can have repeat um, bio blitzes in the same place over a period of time to get even more intense data for science? That, that's an excellent idea. That, I mean, that would, would have been perfect was to have done before the fires, immediately <laughs> after the fires, and then yeah, on. Yeah. that would have been the perfect type of data. Um, so we didn't yeah. have the logistical ability to pull that off, but that for future work, and especially for fires, if you know they're coming, if they're um, sort of hazard reduction burns or something like that, there's really potential to do that, I think, moving uh, forward. And I think as citizen science gets more and more um, accepted and, and there are more and more people engaged in it, then there are more opportunities to get that baseline data before um, big events happen. So. Let's hope we can we can help with that. Let's hope we can promote it and, and advance it. So thank you very much, Will. And uh, for the last big session that we've got tonight, um, we're going to uh, talk about something which has been developed in Australia. Um, I'd like to invite Michelle, Larissa, and Savannah to talk about the Great Southern Bioblitz, which is now in its coming up for its third year and is growing dramatically. And yes, uh, welcome and please go ahead. Over to you, Larissa. Yeah, just a second, I'll get my screen. Sorry, can't find mine. Um, Can you see my screen? 
Can you? Yes. Yep, they're all good. Thank you. So, yes, hello everyone. Uh, I'm sharing uh, a little bit about the story of the GSB, the Great Southern Bioblades, and how we started and how we are growing, how we have been growing in the past three years. So we are going to our third edition of the GSB. We started in 2020 uh, during COVID. So it was a very challenging year, but we have been having like new people uh, registering every year, new participants, new local organizers every year. And yeah, I'm happy to share a little bit about our story. Uh, yeah, so just sharing a little bit about me before I get started. Uh, I am a biologist and a science teacher from Brazil. Uh, I am passionate about uh, science communication, community engagement, and also making science accessible and available to the whole community. Science available to everyone. So that's the reason I started my PhD in citizen science and mosquito monitoring. And yeah, I just got my conferral last week. So yeah, I am still living a dream and looking for a job now. <laughs> so that's a little bit about me. But yeah, about the GSB. Uh, so first, who we are. So we are many. We are a lot of people around the world. We are spread in 22 countries now. We started like with 12 countries in 2020, but we had nine, 18 countries last year, and now we have 22 registered. Uh, we are over 6,000 observers all over the world and over 100 local organizers from different continents. And yeah, we also live in different places. So we have people participating like, from the country, from the coast, from deserts, from the mountains, from the bush. So we have a huge diversity of citizen science engagement and also biodiversity data collected on iNaturalist. And yeah, so as we are spread in three continents, we also have, we also speak at least three languages. So yeah, we have a, a big diversity on how the GSB is organized in every place. Uh, and yeah, we co-created the Great Southern Bioblitz. This is uh, a citizen science initiative to observe as many species as possible over spring in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, the GSB was born in Australia in 2020. It was inspired by the City Nature Challenge uh, in 2019, actually, uh, which is a global bio blitz during springtime in the Northern Hemisphere. But the CNC happens every year in late April and in early May because it is spring uh, in the Northern countries. But it is very cold in Australia and the other southern uh, countries, the countries in the southern hemisphere. So in 2019, uh, four cities participated in Australia for the first time in the CNC. And after the event, the Australian organizers, they wanted to explore more. They wanted to use more iNaturalist to engage more people and explore more the biodiversity during the spring in our hemisphere, in our country. And so they started growing this idea of running a similar event, but during a more, uh, during, during spring uh, here in the Southern Hemisphere. So the idea started to grow. Uh, and yeah, we started talking to people and inviting friends. And uh, we launched the GSB as an international a global period of intense biological surveying with three main uh, objectives. So we wanted to either like, highlight the immense biodiversity spread across the Southern Hemisphere. We also wanted to engage the public in citizen science and nature learning. And also we wanted to build a network of citizen science facilitators. So the idea was also to engage with people from different parts of the world and to see how they are leading the citizen science initiatives, how they are leading the bioblitz in different parts, uh, in different countries, and how successful they are, what are their challenges, what are their opportunities, and how we can learn with other stories about citizen science and engaging people to use a naturalist. So these were the main objectives of the GSB. 
And to collect, to engage people and collect data on biodiversity, we use iNaturalist, uh, which as we said, it is an open source, an open access platform, an international network and database of biodiversity. And it contributes to nationally, it contributes to Australia, to the Atlas of Living Australia. And also globally, it contributes to, to the GBIF, which is the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. So it is also an open access uh, database of biodiversity. But that's the GBIF's global. And yeah, these are some of our organizers, but we have many more. We have over 100 people uh, engaging citizen scientists in their local areas. And as we are from different countries and different continents, we are the Great Southern BioBlitz in English, we are the Gran Bio Buscada del Sur in Spanish, and we are a Grande BioBlitz do Hemisfério Sul in Portuguese. And yeah, we are, we are growing. So something interesting to highlight is that the first year of the GSB, the GSB was born uh, during challenging times, actually. Uh, it was born in 2020, which was the first year of COVID. And so many areas, many, many cities, different countries, they were in lockdown. So people were isolated in their homes. So in the first, the first years of the first year of engagement, we recommended people to make the observations from their backyards, mainly from their backyards, because not every place uh, was able to go to national parks to explore their suburbs or to explore their, their areas uh, in, in parks or in green areas in their cities. So it was different, the engagement was different depending on the country and the city where people were participating. And so it was very challenging the first year in 2020. And it was also after the bushfires uh, in 2019. So it was, it was a very challenging year. And even with all these challenges, we had over 90,000 observations in the first year of the GSB of over 12,000 species and more than 3,000 people participating from 12 countries and from 157 different areas cities or uh, local local areas. And yeah, these are some of the observations recorded in the first year. Some of these observations were recorded for the first time in some places like this fish in Kenya. It was recorded for the first time on my naturalist. And it, it happened in many different cities uh, in 2020 and in 2021 as well. Uh, these were the countries that participated in 2020. And here uh, on the second graph, we can see the difference of observations on my naturalist uh, comparing the observations on 2020 and in 2019. So we can see the impact of the Great Southern BioBlitz to collect data for the platform for iNaturalist. Uh, and yes, yeah, some of the contributions, uh, Thomas and Corey, they published a paper last year, no, in 2021, yeah, last year. And so they analyzed, actually they described the contributions of iNaturalist in Australia and the possible future directions for iNaturalist. And so on this paper, they analyzed the data upload uploaded, sorry, on a naturalist uh, over the past years. And so they observed that for the first time, uh, a naturalist Australia had over 100,000 observations on a single month. And it happened during the Great Southern Bioblades. So we know it had a huge impact on the data collected in Australia nationally. So we can say it was a, a historical contribution for iNaturalist Australia. And so we started growing actually. So from 2020 to 2021, we almost doubled the, actually we more than doubled the number of observations. We had a hundred, almost 200,000 observations and over 6,000 people participating from 18 countries and 245 local areas. So these, yeah, these are the countries that participated last year. 
And these are some of the some of the observations that we had from different places. And here we can see the engagement on the platform keeps growing as well. So we can compare uh, the green is from 2021, the gray is from 2020. Uh, and actually we ran the we ran the GSB in a different time last year. In 2020, we ran in September, late, late September, which was which was early spring in the Southern Hemisphere. But even though it was springtime, some countries were still very cold. And like in the Southern Argentina, for example, people were like had lots of snow during the first year of the GSB. So last year we moved it to a bit late in late October, which is going to be a similar date, similar period this year as well. So that's why we can select this different peak here in that collection. But we can see not only during the GSB, this other peak here represents the CNC, the City Nature Challenge. But something interesting is that not only during the GSB, we can see the engagement on my naturalist keeps growing throughout the year. We can see like more observations throughout the year, not only during events. Between events, we can see people are becoming a bit more engaged and getting more used to share their observations, to upload their observations on my naturalist. If it is because of the GSB, we don't know, but we know that, that there are many other bioblitz happening throughout the year and using a naturalist to collect the data. And yeah, so now we are preparing for the GSB 2022, which is going to be late October. And we already have 22 countries registered. And yeah, we are open to registrations. We already have 50 areas in Australia or a bit more, I'm not sure, but the last count we had 50 local areas in Australia registered. And to share some of the outcomes, uh, more than collecting data for biodiversity, I think one of the biggest outcomes for us was to connect with people, connect with the citizen science facilitators from different places and to learn like, how they can engage people in different scenarios with different challenges. So it was a very uh, powerful outcome to us to be able to connect with teachers, environmental educators, researchers, museums, tour guides, uh, not-for-profit organizations, and all of those people were moved by the same passion for nature, biodiversity, and community engagement. Uh, some outcomes as well, we could see, we could get new users for iNaturalist, and new species recorded on iNaturalist as well. In 2020 and 2021, we could see new species, species recorded for the first time. Uh, and also, we can you know, help, we can enhance the accuracy of the identification tools. So the more people use the platform, the better uh, the identification tools become. So we can help building capacity and education through the connectivity on iNaturalist between citizen scientists and people making the identifications as well. Uh, we had lots of stories, people sharing with us from different places. I got just two quotes from people saying, saying like the first one is from Argentina. Uh, she was a teacher. Actually, both of them were teachers, but no, she was saying uh, she took a photo of a spider in her house and she thought it was a very common spider. But when she uploaded the photo, she saw it was the first record of that species in her area, the first record on my naturalist. And like we were talking to her and she said, you know, she, used, she usually sees that same spider like always, like throughout the whole year. And she thought it was very common to everyone, but not everybody uploads the photos on my naturalist. Not everybody uses a naturalist on a day-to-day -day basis. So that was quite interesting to see like something really common, but it was unique. It was a new, um, a new species that she was helping, she was contributing to the platform. And there was another teacher sharing that she really enjoyed uh, encouraging her students to connect with nature and to register, register biodiversity using phones because, you know, like it really, it really engages kids 
And she said it was a lot of fun to see her students excited about, you know, going out on nature, especially because it was uh, during COVID. So it was something new to be able to observe species and to share with naturalists. So they were learning a lot of new, new things at the same time. Uh, some of the challenges we also observed between since our first edition in 2020 until now, uh, although we can see the engagement is increasing, it is still hard to us to, to keep the engagement between events. We can see online naturalists, we can see like when we compare it on the graphs, the engagement is growing from one year, comparing one year to the others, to the past years, but it's still, it's not comparable to the engagement that we have during the four days of BioBlitz. So we still always think and have the discussion how we can keep the engagement not as high as during the BioBlitz, but at least higher, like how we can get, keep people uh, sharing the photos, making observations and uploading these photos throughout the whole year. So that's still a challenge to us. Keep people motivated throughout the whole year to keep observing and sharing space through, during different seasons. Uh, getting ideas sometimes we like will don't have maybe we don't have the connections or it's hard to get the experts uh, in identifying some specific taxes, taxa. Uh, and some of other challenges as well. Like we have a lot of friends in Brazil, in South America. I am from Brazil. And I had like two friends, two different people from different states sharing with me that they had some weird messages on my naturalist, people asking them to share, to send some seeds from the Amazon uh, by mail to them because they saw the photos on my naturalist. So like they used the iNaturalist message uh, to talk to them and to ask for, you know, like them to send some species, some seeds. So that is a really challenge. So they reported that to a naturalist. I don't know the outcome actually, but they reported that. So it is something, yeah, we have to be careful. We have to, you know, like recommend our participants to, you know, be always careful, not, not engage with uh, these weird messages or just maybe poachers or, you know, people interested in setting that up. Like we don't have actually this kind of control. So it is another challenge to us. And what one of the final challenges we usually discuss that how to integrate this data in conversational our species management programs. How we can actually translate the data collected on my naturalist and people engagement uh, onto programs. So these are some of the challenges. And yeah, finally, some of the main outcomes as we are from different places, we had people participating in different ways we had people uh having a bus going camping in, in you know like onto the into the wild to take photos we had teachers engaging their students we had environmental educators doing all sorts of different programs during the day at night we had observations from you know like countryside from the coast so we had really rich the kind of data that we had either for a naturalist and for people participating. So yeah, now we are getting ready for the Just Be 2022. And we are running by the end of October from 28th to the 31st of October. And yes, we are growing. We already have 50 local areas in Australia. And yeah, if you want to get some more information, you can have a look at our website and our social media. And if you want to register your local area to participate, we will be very happy to see new people coming, joining us, and getting new observations. So yeah, that's a little bit about the story of the JCB, how we started, how we are growing, uh, countries that we are engaging. And now I'd like to introduce Suvana. Uh, I got the whole name, Sylvan. So, oh, I don't have her yes, family name. Yes, you need to hang on a sec. Just, uh, if you want to just stop sharing your screen. Yes, sure. And we'll just swap it over. Uh, just finding where Sylvana has got to here. Yes, and actually I don't have her family name, but I will get it. Yeah, I do have. 
<laughs> so, sorry, I'd like to introduce Silvana Parbo Mohan. I hope I said it right. She is the manager of the citizen science programs at South African National Biodiversity Institute. She is also the associate director of Custodians of Rare and Endangered Wildflowers, the citizen science program. And she is also the chair of Botanical Society and Coastal Branch of the KZN. And she's the co-chair of the IUCN Southern Africa Plant Specialist Group. Sure, thanks, Libby. Um, I guess that's quite a mouthful. Um, but yeah, thanks so much to the organizers for this opportunity to showcase South Africa. And yes, we're really, really excited to um, be hosting Great Southern BioBlitz once again. But also we do host BioBlitzes across the year, which I will explain um, in a little detail. So yes, I sit within South Africa, but um, we work within Southern Africa. So these are just a few countries that um, are within Southern Africa. It's 11 countries. Um, and you can see South Africa is the southernmost. And I'm actually based on the east coast of South Africa. Um, so in 2019, we began um, participating in the City Nature Challenge. Um, as was previously mentioned, and although this project started or this pilot started in 2016 and we got on board in, 20, in 2019, um, it became quite a huge thing for the country um, and various cities to participate. And you can just see the results from this year's City Native Challenge. And for the first time, um, the city of Cape Town in South Africa actually um, took second place in City Native Challenge. So we're really excited to hear about the Great Southern Bio Blitz being started up in 2020. Um, and we started really small because we were still quite fatigued out of um, the City Nature Challenge that happened in April. So to redo the, the wheel um, in October was quite an um, um, enormous task, also given that we were um, stuck at home with the pandemic. So we started small with two South African cities um, and four Southern African countries. And then in 2021, it just spiraled. Um, and you can see we've got 11 regions in South Africa um, and various countries within Southern Africa participating. Um, so a huge increase in participation, but I'd like to draw your attention to the number of observations and species. So we had more than 50% of our observations that were identified, which is a small proportion of casual observations. So which means that most of our observations were taken out on uh, wild species and in wild area, wild natural areas. And then looking at the species, uh, predominantly plants. So more than 50% of our observations um, were plants. So probably more than 60% actually, followed by insects. Um, and then birds, surprisingly mammals was just a small proportion, given that mammals always receives attention um, across documentaries and conservation awareness. And despite having a huge coastline, we had very few um, observations from the marine realm. Um, and it's something that we're still grappling with. So just taking you through some of the observations. Um, these are, um, sorry that the, I'm unable to see my screen completely. Here we go. So these are some of the favorite observations uh, from GSB last year. And you can see that we had oh, just under 500 species um, that was um, listed as favorites. Um, oopsie. Um, we don't only look at photos, but we also do lots of sounds. And again, here you can see the number of um, observations that we had just for sounds. We do encourage um, photos and non, um, we don't encourage observations without photos or sound, um, although that is allowed on INET. So we, we prefer to have at least a sound or a photo for each of our observations. Um, then looking at threatened species, so South Africa is one of the few uh, mega diverse countries who have all of our plant species red listed. Um, and you can see that not just our plant species, but there's also a variety of taxonomic groups that have undergone the red list process. Um, and you can see just a snapshot of the threatened species that was documented during GSB last year. 
and some of the endemic species. So we've also got different projects where we, we upload all of this uh, species onto the endemic project or the um, threatened project, threatened species project. Um, and so we're able to pull out the stats um, quite easily. So looking at the GSB global results, if we just look at the observations, yes, four of the uh, five top five positions were held by South African cities. Uh, but if we look at species, again, South Africa's top, uh, the top three um, spots were held by South Africa for top species during the GSB. And then looking at observations, we haven't done quite well. So we've got the highest observations uh, or the highest number of observers in, with the city of Cape Town. Um, and you can see there's just Overstrand, which is another South African um, city um, here with 180. So we haven't done well with getting in more observers to participate. Um, again, looking at the Southern African Umbrella Project at INAT, we've got only 123 people that have joined. So us advertising events on um, the iNaturalist project, as well as um, providing stats and um, asking for assistance with identifications doesn't quite help on iNaturalist itself, which means we do have to do lots of other work um, out of iNat to, to encourage people to assist with the IDs. So apart from Great Southern BioBlitz, we also host other BioBlitzes during the course of the year. Um, this is the Marine Protected Area Day, which was um, held on the 1st of August, and we've had a BioBlitz the weekend before. Um, once again, I, I don't have the stats here, but the stats was quite poor um, in the amount of participation in the marine realm. And we have various other bioblitzes. So this is a snapshot of a bioblitz of a proposed national park coming up in um, one of the eastern regions of South Africa. And here you can see we went to various farms and this bioblitz was held both by specialists and very few citizen scientists, though citizen scientists are continually contributing to the project. So we've had um, over 50 um, Taxon experts join us during a week-long bioblitz at the site. And you can see we've surveyed um, five different sites and got quite a lot of data coming through. Again, not all of the data is on INAT. Um, quite a lot of new species and range extension species also um, brought forward during that one-week bioblitz. So it's getting the specialists together with um, citizen scientists to contribute to biodiversity and to engage with each other and learn from each other. So this BioBlitz has been um, the first time that we actually hosted specialists and um, citizen scientists together at such a huge scale. And we intend to do this um, funding permitted uh, on an annual basis. So some of the yays and nays of um, how we've done bioblitzes. So um, we try to work during flowering season, which is great that the GSB is actually during spring and much later than um, early spring. We've got the uh, BOTSOP membership countrywide. So basically a plant-driven um, citizen science membership based on NGO. Um, and we use their members to, to be the champions of the Great Southern Bioblitz and the CMC. Uh, in their respective regions. We've got identifiers across the region. So South African identifiers are also assisting with the other Southern African countries. Um, and we've got, we create links um, to provide for our identifiers. Instead of them just strolling through a whole host of observations, we provide them with specific links for them to just hone into their specialist observation um, IDs. And then things that we are struggling with is um, participation in each of the regions. So you can see that we've got really low numbers of participation, though we do work really hard and, and make up the numbers of observations and species that we look at. Um, the way we tackle identifications is great for now, but with us expanding our naturalist um, observations and participation during these um, annual events, we are struggling quite a bit with uh, getting everything identified according to the uh, specified time frame. Um, and then advertising, we're not great at advertising our events, we um, quite low key, but um, still within the, the small microcosms that we work in, I think we do quite well. Um, and then linking to this session around making our bioblitzes more valuable. So we, we make sure that 
Um, our bio blitzers are, although unlike scientific surveys, um, we collect data quickly, but as I mentioned before, we do try to get specialists out into the field um, and provide that engagement between specialists and citizen scientists. We work with our local conservation agencies quite closely. So during these um, bio blitzers, we can survey priority areas, remnant patches of natural vegetation, unsampled sites, uh, post fire sites, um, survey for invasive alien species, including those that are emerging, which is quite important, and then looking at our protected areas as well. Um, we increase our surveys um, of our endemic and threatened species with, with the GSB and CNC. Um, we challenge citizen scientists to search for taxa that have not yet have not been seen for a long time, and we've done pretty well with finding species that were thought to be extinct. Um, and we're finding them after at least um, 100 to 80, 80 to 100 years. So our citizen scientists get to explore their immediate natural environment. And then the more observations uploaded, the greater the learning curve of uh, biodiversity across the different taxa. So looking at GSB 2022, we've once again expanded from last year. So we've got 16 regions in South Africa participating. For the first time, we've got Mozambique coming on board. Um, and we're looking to get more um, support on the west coast of Southern Africa. So it's, um, yeah, almost all systems go and, and we're very much into um, hosting webinars to train people to, to work on iNaturalist so that come the weekend people are aware. Um, and that again, hasn't quite picked up. So we still have quite a lot of observations which are of poor photographic quality or have many species on one observation. Um, so we try to host photographic courses and we've got a few videos uploaded onto YouTube, but um, yeah, still, still quite a challenge. And with that, I'd like to again say thank you everybody for this opportunity to showcase Southern Africa. Thanks. Mm -hmm.